What's up guys, Ian Sandusky from Lakewood Machine and Tool back here again for Practical Machinist. Today we are continuing our path through North Carolina and I have something kind of special for you. We're gonna to get to check out a shop that has a bit of a small footprint, but a very large impact. We're here at Protodyne Manufacturing in North Carolina and we're gonna check out just what this shop does. Let's go take a look. We are in cotton country, aren't That's we? That's correct, yeah. I'm learning more about North Carolina as I come down here. How are you doing that? Because those are angles. Holy. That's a well-organized drawer. All this stuff in here, I'm self-taught. I only laugh when I say self-taught because your ability to teach yourself things here is, is crazy. So here we are, guys, inside Protodyne, joined by my friend Kyle. Kyle, thank you very much for having us today. Thanks for coming out. Now, how many people here work with you at Protodyne? Uh, right now, I've got one part-time guy, and I'm getting ready to hire another full-time guy. Um, I've kept it small. It's worked well for me because I, I think I found a niche in prototyping. Very low quantity, very high complexity, very quick turnaround. Those are three, two of those aren't hard to hit, but three it, I've seen to find a, a nice area there that's worked well. So that's kind of how you guys have differentiated yourselves and Correct. really managed to stay. I mean, how long have you guys been here? Um, I've been in business since 2000 and Ten. In this spot here, how many machines do you have? I have five machines. Uh, I've got a manual lathe and a bridge port that they don't count technically, but I've got uh, three Haas mills, a uh, Haas five axis mill, and a Haas turning center. So this here, as far as I can tell, this is a heat treat oven. It is, yep. And that, what kind of industries are you working on that kind of work for? Um, textile. Textile Most, industry. Yeah. So yeah. stuff for like blow molds or? Uh, no, it'd be like cotton mills and we are in cotton country aren't that's we correct yeah <laughs> i'm learning more about north carolina as we come down here <laughs> absolutely now this is a really nice looking this is an auto saw is it not no it's not no nope, just a simple do all um it's one thing that i've tried to do building this business is to take pride in my equipment um i always try and buy really nice really clean if it's used well taken care of, or care of uh pieces so but i mean this is an amazing saw. You clearly spent a lot of money on it. How did you get started in this industry to all of a sudden be able to turn around? Not all of a sudden, I'm sure there's a lot of work that went into it. Turn around and now you have all this equipment. How did that happen? Uh, so I have a mechanical engineering degree, uh, say 2010. I just got bored. Um, I graduated in 2009, but 2010, full-time job. I'm sitting at my house doing nothing. So I thought, well, I'll buy a bridge port. Oh yeah. And uh, I bought the bridge port, you know, and I, I had worked in a machine shops in summers over high school. And then were you doing just kind of custom work for overflow for people yeah, or? Yeah, I mean, it, it turned out, I bought the machine to make stuff for me and my dad. Um, I've never made anything for me or my dad. <laughs> Funny how it works out it's like just, that sometimes. It, eh? I was so lucky to have a good group of guys I graduated with. They were sending me work um, because they needed stuff at their new place of business. and. Um, it just, it worked perfect. It was a perfect storm. What's this giant slug that we're sitting in front of here? That is a, a three position fixture for my UMC. So you'll, I think they're separated 120 degrees and then at a 60 degree angle. So you can put three fifth axis rock lock vices on it. So you're going to be building that yourself? Oh yeah. And you do all the design, you do all the programming yourself? That's correct. And you're using... Well, and I say the design most everything comes in here pre-designed. Um, the way I've looked at it, I can either spend my time at five machines running five spindles for five times the money or at one computer. And I say that the programming is a little different, but. Programming is something that you have to do yourself more yeah. or less. That's something that should kind of come in pre-drawn pre or pre-designed. Right, yeah. Now this is a big boy. This is a VF3 YT. What year is this one here? This is a 2014. Uh, this was the third machine that I bought. Do you mind if I pop the yeah, door? go ahead. So you're running Kurt Vices in here. Is this a pretty standard setup for what you keep in here most of the time? Yes, it is. Um, that one specific part I made really big fixtures for. I had a 90 degree angle plate in there. Um, it was a big piece. So I, I, I took up a lot of real estate there. Now I prefer keeping the vices in there. It's just, it's quick, it's simple. Um, but I do have a TR-210 that, that can go in there. Now this here, 
Is this a pretty standard part you'd run in a quantity? How many a part like this would you be running? Uh, 10 to 20. Um, that particular customer I do a lot of work for. Uh, I mean, there's header flanges here, a much bigger quantity, but um, they do headers for performance cars. Um, what grade of stainless is that? 304. This is 304? Yeah. For those of you who don't know, a 304 can really be difficult to work with. <laughs> it work hardens, it's tough, it eats your cutters. Yeah. What kind of strategies do you use? Like This to me looks like a bit of a nightmare because there's so much material to pull out. What are you doing different than everybody else to make a part like this that comes out looking this nice? I've heard 304 is terrible to deal with. I, I never found it to be that bad. Fair enough. <laughs> um, but to answer part of that question, high speed machining I think is is so simplified now. It's so user friendly. Um, and it seems to, your manufacturers have everything together now to where they'll give you a good baseline and you work with your machine to adapt, right? This isn't a, Her or, you know, a Herco, a Kuma. It's not a heavy duty machine. Right. So you can't just use their Mazak numbers, but you can dumb them down just a little bit and get to a pretty good Pretty good zone. And run it up till it starts looking not so nice yeah. and then turn it back down yeah, a bit. Or until your tool explodes. Th that also <laughs> happens. Now with a part like this, just to kind of stay on here for one sec, when you're doing a lot of this hogging out, are you using, with high speed machining, okay. are you doing more adaptive clear? It's a good mix of both. I think with the way Mastercam has their software set up, like I said, it just, it kind of figures out a lot of that for you. It'll trochoid in the corners and it'll just feed mill around the perimeter until it gets into small pockets and um, yeah I, I mean I, I can't say enough about that software feature. So that's using something like dynamic OptiRough? Yeah. To yeah. use a lot of that. That's I've really interesting. A, I've got another one I can show you too. So that's 304 as well? That is correct. I use a half inch tool, um, half inch carbide and it just works out right to be able to go down all the way from this side and then I'll flip it over and go from the other and get side. The, oh, and I you see. can just barely see a cusp on both. Just barely yeah. though. So it works out really well. Now when you're fixturing that, are you using some kind of zero point fixture or are you just using a, a pretty jaws. standard? Soft jaws. And then this here, this is a beautiful machine. When did you get this UMC 750 in? I got this in March of this year. I was really nervous getting it. It was a big investment. Um, I have loved this machine. I've been so happy with this machine so far. Um, and it's really weird because it seems to be a polarizing machine. I've talked to half the guys that absolutely hate it. Really? And half absolutely love it, what I've found. And then this is an example of a part you'd be running in here? Yeah. So this is, this is aluminum. That's correct, yeah. Now this is a pretty crazy part because, I don't know if you guys can see this, it's a, a manifold of some description. Yeah but that goes all the way through, but there's almost no mating marks on the inside of that. Right. How would you attack a job like this? Uh, so I attacked it the hard way initially, um, and I spent a little bit of time with multi-axis struggling because all this stuff in here I'm self-taught. Right. So I've got to learn the hard way and I've got to learn really fast. Uh, what I found was port expert for Mastercam. I had somebody help me with, um, it made it so simple, it was crazy. Uh, I'd spent hours trying to cut this thing apart and get the seams where they needed to be so I could reach. And a buddy of mine was like, hey, I've got this addition, why don't you try it? And uh, it was amazing. He was like, I'd never used it before and it took five minutes. So hold on, let's back up a second. You bought this and then taught yourself five axes. That's correct, yeah. You like to learn to fly on your way down. What other way is there? I, I suppose <laughs> not. That's, that's incredible. What's, um, the, uh, what's the biggest job you've run on this so far? Uh, I've run probably 12 inch diameter piece so far. Sounds um, like there was a lot of material coming off it. <laughs> the programming is simple. The setups are simple. That was my concern because, hey, I got to get this thing run and making money. Um, I love it. It's, it's amazing. This is a nice little, like, I would consider it a tool room lathe. Yeah. ST10. ST yeah. And how long have you had this one here? Uh, 2012. That was my second machine. The first machine I bought brand new. And are you a self-taught lathe guy as well? That's correct. That, <laughs> now mind you, I have it's 10 amazing. years of learning 
with Mastercam now, I found turning to be difficult. I still hate it to this day. It's no longer, two axis turning is no longer difficult for me. I just hate turning. I, I am also a mill guy. I'm a, I only laugh when I say self-taught because your ability to teach yourself things here yeah. is, is crazy. Yeah, it's, it, it it's, takes a lot of dedication and skill that way. Yeah. Now moving over here, I see some pretty crazy parts. What are we looking at here? That looks like some kind of impeller. Yep, that's an impeller and this is a water pump for uh, Chevrolet, in fact. And that's all done in your VF2? That's correct. Well, actually I've used all machines to do that, so. That's absolutely crazy. That one obviously is a five axis part. Mm -mm. No. No. How did no, you achieve that with the only, five axis? The only headache, everything is seen from above. The only headache is they called out a really small radius in that corner. So I had to use a small tool sticking out, you know, 10 times D and you can see the step down. You know, you can see every time I had to step that tool down to just cut five thousandths off. Um, what was your cycle time on, like on a park like that? Probably an hour and a half, maybe. That's pretty quick, Two especially hours. if you're probably using what, a 30 yeah. thou end mill or something? Oh yeah, it was tiny. Absolutely, yeah. it's a hair. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a VF2 SS. This is actually fairly new. Yep. So what does a machine like this one, because this is a smaller footprint, fast moving machine, what kind of stuff do you do in here versus your other machines? Uh, more production, just um, mold. Uh, I try not to take on high quantity, but for sure, I mean, all shops have to at some point. So I'll definitely do production. It's worked really well for the water pumps because those are long cycle time assemblies. Um, and it's, it's really been a great machine. It, it's, you know, I'm very pleased with it. Um, now, when it comes to running all these machines, when do you find time to sleep? If you're doing the programming and doing the majority of the running? Yeah, that's been, uh, that's been special. Um, I, up until recent, I've worked seven days a week, 12, 16 hours a day, and it, uh, I'm done. You're done with that for now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't have any regrets. Uh, this has been a great business to part of, be a part of. The only thing I don't like about it is the cost to be a part of it. Right. Your software, your, you know, I've probably had in the last seven years, five guys come in here with multi-millions and say, hey, we've got five machines on the way. You want to come work for us? Because you look at it, I mean, that mill is expensive, but it's not that expensive. But then when you buy the tooling and the software and the tools and, and the, the tool work holders, um, you know, that's where things really just start escalating quick. Absolutely, and especially when you are a smaller shop, my shop is small as well, dishing out the twenty to $30,000 for software. Yeah. And you know, to tool up, I just got a new machine, I was happy to get it, and then I didn't realize that none of my old tooling fit it. Yeah. So I had to go buy all new tooling. And then yeah. I figured out, oh, it's a bigger chuck. So now I gotta buy 12 inch chuck jaws or make them. Yeah. It, as you say, the bar it's not only the barrier to entry, it's the cost you have to pay to stay in the game too. Yeah. You know, here's, this is where the tooling is at here. Um, so we have drills. Holy, that's a well-organized drawer. Uh, high, speed seed, high speed steel and carbide in there? Uh, high speed steel primarily. I have a lot of tool uh, sales guys recommend carbide, but when you have to have that many drills just to do any job that comes in the shop. As a job shop, I agree with you. There's... I only buy it if I'm doing some crazy production. With a lot of the parts you're running, you know, they have some tight tolerances and I take it you're setting up tools a lot. Is something like tool presetting something you've thought about? Uh, because I don't take a lot of production, it seems like every day, uh, every one of these machines comes apart almost every day, it feels like. I mean, different, something different is a drill or, or a little ball mill or whatever. Um, it's not a production shop. So right. like I said, I've got, I think there's eight tools in each machine, your standard half inch, a three quarter, uh, chamfer mill, that kind of stuff that stays forever. So when you program, you know it's already in pocket Correct. two. Yeah, and my like my stainless machine, I have, I think 12 tools that machine every one of those flanges. Those 12 tools live in there for good. Um, if I need to change them out, you change them when they break, but. That's about it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Kyle, thank you very much for having us today. Thanks if for your time. If people wanna find out more about Protodyne, where can they go? Uh, www.protodynemfg.com. 
uh, or my Instagram is at protodynemfg. Or they can come on down to North Carolina. Or you can come on down, you're welcome anytime. <laughs>